Now I realize now, I have lots of information here about um, what's happening today, and I do not actually have written down the precise title of your chair. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, Mark, is to, is to introduce yourself and the name of the chair. Thank but you. handing over to Mark, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think it's the... Actually, I don't know the precise... <laughs> <laughs> and we went through a few iterations. At, at, at what point it was going to be the, the HP Research Chair in Cybersecurity. And I think, I think I'm going to leave it at that rather than trying to remember some of the other alternatives that we considered. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. And I must say, I'm truly honored that uh, you've all taken time out of your day to come here today to, to celebrate what, I'm, what is obviously a very wonderful thing, which is that HP have decided to invest in our uh, department. And of course, a lot of people have um, helped to make this happen. Of course, I'm the one who's worked the hardest. Let me just... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I actually particularly want to thank Padma, because Padma has done an enormous amount of work. And uh, I'm not going to go through the various hurdles that we had to face when establishing this chair, but there were quite a few. And uh, I, I particularly remember one dinner, actually, I don't know if you remember Padma, but you know, I was in a bit of a state about why it wasn't working out the way I wanted it to work out. And you were working at home that day, and you said, let's just meet in a restaurant in Harborn and talk about it. And, and we did do that, and uh, then it all seemed better again, <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, this year, 2016, is, uh, at least by some reckoning, the 10th anniversary of the, uh, the group that we have in Birmingham, the, what we now call the Security and Privacy Group. So 10 years ago, in 2006, we first advertised for a position <coughs> of lecturer in computer security. And in fact, we appointed two. We appointed Tom Chotier, who you probably already know because he's here uh, with us still, and another person called Gwilin Wang, who now works at Huawei in uh, Singapore. But uh, I didn't know very much about computer security at that time. I remember asking a PhD student who was working with me to figure out what are the top conferences in security. <laughs> That's how little I, I knew. But in my defense, it was a little bit harder in those days, because not quite everything was on the web as it is now. In fact, just last night, Flavio sent an email message, not only you know, reiterating what we know to be the top conferences, but analyzing the uh, people worldwide who contribute to these various conferences and the extent to which they do so. In those 10 years, our group has come a long way. We've, we've grown hugely. That was our first lecturer. Well, after me, therefore, our second. Now we have a lecturer position which we are advertising. Should anybody want to apply, the closing date is tomorrow. <laughs> um, and that person will increase our number of academics from 10 to 11. Um, and during that 10 years, academic computer science has become hugely competitive. I mean, that's a little bit of a surprise to me. I thought that maybe as the field grows so much, as it has done, because society has taken a huge interest in it, I thought that it might become less competitive. But uh, actually, the opposite seems to have happened. Um, and nowadays, of course, we're very aware of the top uh, computer security conferences. And our group is doing very well on that metric. For your information, by the way, the top conferences are... IEEE Security and Privacy, ACM, CCS, USENIX, and NDSS. And in the last five years, our group has had an average of two papers per year in, that, uh, in those conferences. And I particularly want to acknowledge my colleagues Flavia Garcia, David Oswald, and David Galindo, who have uh, made up the number three for this current year. So we got three in 2016. Well, right now, our, our group uh, as a security group is facing a, a challenge, which uh, is a new one for me anyway. And it's brought about by our own success, and in particular by our diversification into what you might call aggressive evaluation of products, offensive security, some people call it. So my colleagues Flavio Garcia and David Oswald and others have found devastating weaknesses. You may have heard this. It was widely reported in the press in car immobilizers and uh, door unlocking cryptography. And as a result, the university was sued by VW. It was last year or the year before, probably the year before. 
And at the moment, we're developing a code of practice for how we should conduct this kind of research. Because, well, I think the university's motivation is it doesn't want to be sued again. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so the real issue there is how to balance the needs of manufacturers, and that's obviously why VW sued us, because they have their needs, versus what we academics perceive as our wider duty to society. We need to inform society about the actual situation that they face. In particular, we need to inform car purchasers about the risks that they face when they buy a particular car over another one. So we're developing this code of practice, and I want to say that I'm extremely happy with the way our university has approached this. They have asked us to produce the original draft of the code of practice, which we have done, um, and then we sent it to them, and now they have asked us to comment on, uh, or rather there's a sort of negotiation period, if you like, where they've raised some issues that concern them, and we've sent a rebuttal of those issues. And that's where we now stand, by the way, so we only have it in draft form. Um, but let me just mention, I mean, there are divergent ideas there, and I think that we as a group are breaking new ground there. We did make an inquiry to find out from other groups who had this sort of thing, and I couldn't find any, at least, that was publicly available or that was willing to be communicated to me in private. So we are breaking ground, and I want to just mention that if anybody has any ideas about that and would be interested in seeing a draft of our code of practice and possibly contributing to it, then please get in touch with me. Um, <clears throat> our development as a group has not, of course, been in a vacuum. The whole sector has grown enormously. That's to be expected because there's no aspect of our lives these days that doesn't involve computers, and since our daily lives have migrated towards computers, it's not surprising that fraud, theft, and terrorism have done so too. And recently, we have all been anticipating this new wave uh, whereby the internet has eyes and ears and arms and legs. Uh, billions of devices with sensors and actuators are being connected to the internet. Bruce Schneier has called this the world's biggest robot, a web-sized robot is his name for it. But the more familiar name that everyone's talking about is, of course, the Internet of Things, the Internet of Hackable Things, the Internet of Evil Things, it's sometimes called, the Internet of Shitty Things, <laughs> referring to the fact that they are cheaply made, and therefore they are a bit crap, and therefore they are easily hacked and easily reprogrammed, and that, of course, is behind the uh, attack that, uh, that Jonathan was referring to just a, a moment ago, when all this, the threat that we, uh, that we perceived has now become real. So as you surely know, last Friday, or maybe it was the Friday before last, on the 21st of October, there was a major attack where IoT devices that are vulnerable to the attack were, well, attacked and made to launch a distributed denial of service attack on important DNS servers. This caused a huge outage um, around the world. And just speaking for myself, it's one of the few attacks that I, I noticed at the time. I was in my office programming in Python, which is very rare for me to be programming at all, but I was programming in Python, and I tried to look at some Python documentation on the web, and I, I couldn't get to it, and my instant reaction was to blame our IT services people. <laughs> <laughs> but it was not their fault at all. <laughs> I must say you're a great audience because none of these things were planned as jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that attack was pretty simple. The affected devices have a Telnet server inside them and uh, a default username and password. So many, of people have, many people have responded to that and they've said devices shouldn't have a Telnet server inside them. And if they do, for some reason, they shouldn't have default credentials. The credentials should be unique per device. In fact, some people have said there should be a rating system, a little bit like the traffic lights on, your, on, on, on food in the supermarket. There would be some kind of certification that IoT devices have to undergo. And part of that would, of course, involve not having default passwords uh, as part of it. And uh, another part of it that's been proposed is that those devices should have the ability to download security updates or any kind of updates, software updates in general. So that's good, but I don't think that's anywhere near the whole story. It shouldn't be possible for an attacker to access the device from the internet at all, to send any kinds of packets to it. Because if you can send any packet to a device, 
you can potentially trigger a buffer overflow or some other security problem in that device. So the solution I have in mind is that we protect these devices at the network level, because manufacturers are not going to be able to get security right. It is going to be the case that there's a lot of small startup manufacturers who are mostly doing the, the, the <coughs> nature of the particular device in question, whether it's a thermostat or whatever it might be, and they're not going to be cybersecurity experts. So I've, I've developed plans where you could use ideas, for example, from Tor Hidden Services, which is a way you can hide a server from, uh, from people that you don't want to access it, how you could use some of those ideas to hide devices from attackers. But there are lots of complex trade-offs there to do with how much security you want and how much data sharing you want to allow in order to get functionality, and to do with the business models for IoT, because actually that's another thing that's completely uh, unclear at the moment. I actually bought a webcam recently from what I consider to be the best company. It's Nest. It got taken over by Google recently. So you buy a webcam and it costs you, I don't know, 120 pounds. That's quite a lot for a webcam. But then I found out that you have to pay eight pounds per month for the cloud service if you want to be able to look at video uh, that, you, that you know, they've got taken before. So uh, as I say, the business model is by no means sorted out. But that in itself is going to have a huge impact on the security model. <clears throat> so one thing I've learned in the last 10 years during the development of our group, and actually what makes cybersecurity, in my opinion, very interesting, is that it's, it's a political subject as well as a technical subject. So the question of when and how to disclose vulnerabilities, that's, of course, a political question, a, a policy question. The question of how to design security for new domains, that's also a political question. Uh, how to navigate the trade-offs between user privacy, security, and functionality. That's not just within the space of the IoT, but more generally. And of course, that's a political question as well. Well, there's one other domain that I just want to talk briefly about, which is very much a political issue as well. Uh, it's not directly connected with the HP chair, but actually I was very pleased that HP are interested in, in this as, as well, in, in, for perhaps other applications. And it's the question of internet voting. Should we vote online when we, uh, when we cast our ballot, for example, for the referendum or for the next prime minister? Well, that's a very interesting topic from a security point of view because it brings up new security properties that aren't very evident in other, in other domains. The property of verifiability, for example. Any voter should be able to verify that the outcome of the election is the one that was declared. And you should be able to do that verification completely independently of the software and hardware that was used in the election itself. That's the goal that academics have been pursuing in that area. And incoercibility is another goal. It should not be possible for you to prove to a potential coercer how you voted. But those are, that's the directions that academics have been taking. But there are people who say that we shouldn't do research in internet voting at all. And their argument is based on the idea, which I think has a lot of value in it, that, uh, that the risks are too big, that voting is the cornerstone of democracy in some way. If you can't vote securely, then we won't have a democracy. And if we don't have a democracy, we don't have a society, or at least not the kind that we want to have. So those people say we shouldn't have internet voting. And it's very much a current debate. I mean, if you look at Google News, you know, news.google.co.uk, and you type in internet voting, you find that recent people, for example, the uh, former director of GCHQ, Sir David Omand, have recently, in the last month, pronounced on this and, and expressed that view, that society should not go in that direction because it's too risky. Well, we, uh, I in Birmingham, I was going to say we in Birmingham, but let me just speak for myself. I'm not completely convinced about this because it seems to me that it puts security risks ahead of any benefits, ahead of the benefits of enfranchisement, uh, of voter convenience, of, of voters who are working or who are absent for work reasons or absent for any kind of reason, of young people who may be particularly uh, interested or, or wanting to vote online. And also it ignores the benefits of transparency that this technology can, in principle, bring about. Now, I'm aware that there is a lot of research that's needed to make those potential benefits real. But we're talking about whether we should be going in this direction, not whether we've actually got a product to use right now. And it does strike me that as a country that has taken the decision to leave the European Union, 
because I think in part of disenfranchising young people that were more likely to vote uh, remain than their older uh, counterparts, it would be a tragedy if we, if we turn our backs on the technology that could potentially reverse that process of disenfranchisement. And I, I saw recently that Finland on the 24th of October, just last month, announced a new commission to study the possibility of having internet voting in general elections. It seems to me that if we don't participate in this, we can't complain if we don't like the solutions that <coughs> companies and countries are deploying. So just to make it clear, I don't think we have a good solution at the moment, but I very much think that this is the direction that where we should be going in. And uh, well, I think we are going to go in that direction as a group, thanks to this uh, miracle of academic freedom. But I, 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 want, uh, I want to convince you that this is the right direction for our group to go in as well. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly at the end, but I just want to say a, a, a few more things. Um, and one of them starts with a quote which I uh, discovered last night is due to Albert Einstein. I didn't know that before. Albert Einstein is alleged to have said, three great forces rule the world, stupidity, fear, and greed. <laughs> Research in computer science is mostly motivated by greed. <laughs> we want faster computers, we want more efficient databases, better graphics, nicer user interfaces. All that is because we want more and more and more. But uh, computer science theoreticians, by the way, we have a lot of them in, in this department. We're a very big center for theoretical computer science. And they are motivated by stupidity. <laughs> they simply want to understand things better. They, they, there's nothing else behind their motivation in research than trying to clarify things. So they're motivated by security. <laughs> Cybersecurity is the only part of computer science that's motivated by fear. The fear that things will go wrong. And that fear is understandable, but it can be very damaging. It can prevent us embracing new technologies for fear that that criminals will abuse us. It can prevent us in engaging in attack-based research for fear that uh, we will be sued by other companies. And it can prevent us doing research on topics which are risky, like internet voting, but which potentially have great advantages if the risks can be overcome. And uh, when thinking about this fear, I'm, uh, I'm actually reminded by a book that I've, I've long wanted to read, but I confess I've never read it. But I think it might be a good book because it's got a great title. The title of that book is Feel the Fear, but Do It Anyway. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.